Let's, uh, let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today. I pray you would anoint this, your servant. And again, I know that I don't want to sound redundant, but it's something that I am most careful to pray each and every Sunday. Help me to say the things you want me to say. Help me to refrain from those things which you want me to refrain from. So, Lord Jesus, I just thank you for this morning's service. I pray, Father, for those that are watching by Facebook, those that are watching by YouTube. I pray, Lord, those that are here in this place, Lord, that your overwhelming presence would move us, speak to our hearts, because each one of us that are here today are in different places with you. And so, God, have your way, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, uh, t today's message title is Stay Alert. Um, I don't know how long I'm going to be talking about last day stuff, um, but at least for a little while we'll be in last day things. Uh, we're going to be dealing with what Jesus spoke of regarding the last days in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, Luke chapter 21, we're not going to go there today, but it's kind of a repeat of Matthew 24, a couple of different uh, things that uh, Luke adds that Matthew doesn't. And then uh, Matthew 25 as well also has to do with what Jesus is saying about the last days. Now, one of the things that I just want to remind you of, Jesus doesn't necessarily give an order or organization to the last day. He doesn't. He kind of floats as he's talking. Remember we talked about the abomination of desolation last week. And we talked about how that happened in Jerusalem, AD 70. And we talked about how a lot of times folks believe that to be the end time, last days. But there are too many things within the realm of the abomination of desolation, such as people f fleeing and go to the mountains and all this kind of stuff. When Jesus comes back, A, you're not going to be able to flee. And B, if you're a Christian, you don't want to. Right? And so we talked about that last week. And so now we're getting to a place where um, Jesus, again, he kind of floats in and out of talking about what's going to happen. Because you remember the three questions, um, when are you returning, when is, uh, when is the last days, or when will these things happen, and when is the end? And so Jesus is floating between these three things. And that's the cool thing about Jesus. He prepares us, but he wants us to walk a faith walk. So he doesn't tell us every detail about every single thing, about every single, you know, each time, and he doesn't give us time. Because it's a faith walk. Amen? That's what faith is. It's about trusting. And I'm a little short, so sorry again, honey. I used to aim this way, but then I looked on the Facebook, and I'm like, I got my back to er everybody, and so I, I try to float, try to be, you know. And plus, if I'm facing uh, the telephone, sorry, folks, uh, we're on phone. It's high tech for us, and it's good, and hallelujah. But if I'm facing the phone, they can hear me. If my back is to the phone, they can't. So um, <laughs> let's pick it up in verse 27, Matthew chapter 24. Now, Jesus is particular about this. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. You know, I've often thought about that particular uh, statement that he is communicating. And think about this for just a moment. When Jesus returns, and we'll talk about this at a later date, not now, but when Jesus actually comes back physically to earth, most of the then known world that's left after tribulation is going to be ready for war with Israel. Everybody. They're going to hate Israel. They're going to want to defeat Israel. And so a couple of thoughts that I have regarding wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. A um, couple thoughts. Number one, there's going to be war, so there's going to be dead, uh, death. And so, again, folks are going to want to come and kill Israel, and so there are going to be a whole lot of people there uh, at that time. And so when Jesus says, just as the lightning comes from the east, flashes as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. As a matter of fact, it's going to be instantaneous. It's going to be insanely quick. And people are going to see him when he returns. And those that are surrounding Israel, ready to defeat them, will know he's there. Like in a heartbeat. 
As a matter of fact, the Bible says that he's going to defeat the enemies of Israel with the word of his mouth. No sword will be drawn. No bullets will be fired. No nuclear stuff will have to take place. The word of his mouth, he's going to slay nations. That's in Revelation. We're not going there today, but just to let you know. He continues, he says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Now, here's the thing that I find fascinating. Some of this stuff I believe he's talking about is going to be happening in the stars where it says, and then the, sky, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Just like the star appeared when he came, when he was a baby, when he was a newborn, there's going to be some kind of a sign in the sky that's going to declare his coming. That's what he says. He says it's going to be a sign that will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky. Interesting how there's no change. Do you remember when he came at the time that he came and the Magi from the east came over and they were looking for the Messiah. And so what did they do? They talked to Herod the king and talked to some of the Israelis at the time, some of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Where is he supposed to be born? We want to see this king. And they were disturbed. They were distressed, especially Herod. Same thing's going to happen when Jesus returns. Only difference is when he returns the second time, he's not coming as a lamb. He's not coming as a baby. He's coming as a lion of the tribe of Judah. He's going to set the world straight. Let me say this too as we go. How many of you are like me, are absolutely baffled at times at the weirdness of people's aggression for sin and things that don't make sense. They're like, you know, I'm of a generation, those of you that are around my age, older, younger, even a little bit, but I'm of a generation where if you were a boy, you knew. Matter of fact, at the time you were born, you knew. Everybody knew you were a boy. There were certain things that were determining factors. I was a boy. When my daughters were born there were certain determining factors that declared they are girls it's not like that anymore why let me tell you in romans chapter one god talks about something that takes place over humanity and it's called deluding spirits in other words what god is doing is he's saying you really want to go in this direction? I'm going to let you, and I'm going to put a blindness over you so you're not going to understand truth. You're not going to understand common sense. You're not going to understand spiritual things. You're not even going to understand the sign of the times. So don't be surprised or, or um, you know, frustrated or whatever and knock your head against the wall going, why aren't they getting it? This is a sign of God's judgment, a delusion spirit over the minds, eyes, hearts, and ears of men. As a matter of fact, here's the deal. If we justify sin of any kind, we have a delusion that has been put upon us, or we're ignorant to the truth of the Scriptures, one or the other. It's one thing if we're ignorant, we find it in the Scriptures, oh, boy, I can't believe this, this is truth. i got to repent of my wrong ideas, my wrong thinking, my wrong behavior, and I'm going to align myself with Jesus. That's part of repenting. Then we cry out, God, please forgive me, and then we start walking in a different direction. That's different than when we maybe don't even care about what the scriptures teach or whatever, but we're going to live life any way we want. We're going to justify our sin. That is what we call, used to call backsliding. I'm calling it what Romans calls it. It's you are now a uh, having a delusional spirit that is upon you, and you are ignore, you're ign ignorant of truth. God is blocking that from your mind unless you repent. Anytime we justify sin and call it okay, there's a delusional spirit that has come upon us. I didn't make this up. Let's continue. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet blast. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. 
Now learn the parable from the fig tree. As soon as its branch has become tender and sprouts its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all of these things, recognize he is near right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away unless all these things take place. Now he's not talking about the generation that he was speaking to. He's saying when all this stuff starts taking place all over the globe, when all this stuff starts happening, everything that's coming out of my mouth about the end times, the last day, understand this, I'm at the door. He said this generation of those things that take place, this generation, look at it, will not pass away until all these things take place. My guess is, and I say guess carefully, my guess is is that my grandchildren will see the coming of Christ. That's my guess. Now some of us will say, well, you know what, they've been saying that all for so many years. You know, Jesus is coming again, Jesus is coming again, and whatever. But Lord, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that we're coming to a place globally, not just the United States, not just this, not just that, not just Israel, but globally where the signs are prevalent and evident like they've never been. Jesus is coming. As a matter of fact, if I can say this, and yeah, this is going out on Facebook. Those of you that get anything from Jay Sokolow, he's a lawyer, Christian lawyer for the United States. He's uh, Donald Trump's lawyer or whatever. The reason I'm telling you that is this. He has sent me an email recently. Are you ready? Our current administration is anti-Christian to the point where they're aggressively pursuing things to stop us from talking, from communicating, from sharing Jesus. There are things that you and I don't even know that are happening right now in our country and globally. This is the time where we're to be sober-minded, on the alert, prepared. Amen. Now, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So the sign of Jesus' return, the parable in Luke, includes a second world event. So I guess we are going in Luke today. So Luke chapter 17, verse 28 to 30. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot left Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Now notice... Right here where it says, and they didn't understand. Actually, I think it was in Matthew. They didn't even understand, right? Listen to what 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says. And when I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come as someone superior in speaking ability or wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I also was with you in weakness and fear and in great trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of mankind, but on the power of God. Boy, do we need that in a church today. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which, listen carefully, none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Delusion. Delusion. And that wasn't just the Romans. That was the religious leaders. Delusion. They did not understand. What does the Bible say concerning the spiritual condition of both places? Now, let me back, well, let me, before I go, can continue. You got to understand when Jesus said that it's going to be like the days of Noah, it's going to be like the days of Lot, you have to understand that when it says, and they were taken without knowing the time, they were, it was like they were being taken by surprise. 
Think about this. Why are they being taken by surprise? I almost wonder if we go back to Amos chapter 8, verse 11, where it says there's going to be a famine in the land in the last days, not a famine of bread and water, but a famine of hearing the Word of God. So if the Word of God is not being proclaimed, or even if it is, and they're ignorant to it, they ignore it, they don't want to follow the Lord Jesus, they don't want to repent, they don't want to give up their sin, then what happens is that delusional spirit comes, and then they think they've got all kinds of time, and they just live their life, and they do whatever. And then all of a sudden, the Bible says, Jesus is going to come, just like this. And they didn't even recognize his coming. Do you remember when Jesus wept over Jerusalem? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've longed to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks. But you missed the hour of your visitation. Can I tell you that this morning, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, this is the hour of your visitation. Jesus wants to gather you to himself. But you've got to repent. You've got to allow him. Now, the cool thing about God is this. He'll let you do what you want. But remember, whatever decision you make, there are consequences that are outside of your control that take place. Just like if I'm a thief. I don't have to be a thief. I'm not being forced to be a thief. But if I become a thief, then I don't have control over the consequence if I get caught. So what does the Bible say concerning the spiritual condition of both places? Here's where it's really going to bring out where we are in our day and age. In Noah's day, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, 11, and 13 says this. Wickedness was great. Every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. That's what the Bible says. The earth was corrupt in the sight of God. Notice it doesn't say in the sight of man. Why? Because remember, without Jesus, what do we do? We judge ourselves against somebody else and we always come on top. So it says the earth was corrupt in the sight of God. The earth was filled with violence. Humanity, not the devil, had corrupted its way. Hmm. That's what was taking place during Noah's time of the flood. You remember the videos that we saw a couple weeks ago? This stuff was happening worldwide. In Lot's day, Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 13, 13, 18, 20, 19, 4 through 9, and Ezekiel 16, 49, the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked sinners against the Lord. Notice it doesn't say against each other or against their neighbor. Against the Lord. Sin, very aggressive homosexuality. Rape was sought by all the men of the city. And then in Ezekiel, it talks about this is what the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was. Because we always think of homosexuality. Can I tell you, that is the fruit of what's in the root. In other words, that's not the root. That's the fruit. That's the expression of what's down deep in the heart. Just like as Christians, our fruit should be uh, what is from down deep in the root of our lives. Right? So here's what he says. This is the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. You can read it yourself. Ezekiel 16, 49. They were arrogant, they had plenty of food, they were carefree, and they did not help the poor and needy. That's what God told Ezekiel about the sin of Sodom. The fruit of those things was homosexuality. At least that's what it shows us when the angels went to Sodom. They were visited by, the Bible says, all the men of the city. If you read in the book of Judges, there's another time where there was aggressive homosexual behavior, and that was in the days of the judges in the tribe of Benjamin. Now, it doesn't say all the people in the tribe of Benjamin were aggressive like that, but they raped a concubine and killed her. They raped her all night long, and they left her for dead. But here's what it says. When it was time for them to come to to war, they wanted to have all of those people eradicated so that they could put them to death. Because that's what the Bible called for. But what happened is, is the entire tribe of Benjamin defended the evil one. 
Are you hearing me? Here's what I think. I personally believe, I personally think that we're coming to a place where I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing God's judgment a little more aggressive in our country and in the countries around the world that are allowing aggressive LGBTQ community people come after Christians. Because God defends his own. God defends his own. I don't have to fight. I don't have to argue. I don't have to prove anything. I just have to be a Christian. For those of us who were alive in 1999, the state of Vermont was having conferences, meetings about marriage, church, and the law. I went to the meeting. This is before civil unions came into play. I remember. I went to that meeting and I just shared the gospel. I was confronted at the end. Now, I don't know if this person was a part of the LGBT community at the time, but I was confronted at the end with somebody screaming in my face, spit flying and everything else. I mean, he is this close to my face as he's screaming into my face about, you have no business bringing the Word of God here or the Bible here. You got no business talking about God here. I said, well, actually, I do. He was so aggressive and so angry. That was for civil unions. I went to Montpelier a couple of times. And I listened to the argument from the LGBTQ community. Back then it was just gay and lesbian. They didn't have all the other stuff. It was just gay and lesbian. I heard the arguments. We don't want marriage. We just want legal recognition so that when we're together with either two men or two women, we want to have the ability to have them on life insurance and medical insurance and all these different things. We want to have the legal part. He said, we don't want the marriage. We don't want to touch the marriage. That's, that's for the church. We don't care about marriage. I was there. I was sitting in Montpelier in the Capitol hearing it over and over and over and over again, those that were pro-civil unions. And I'm taking the extra time because you've got to listen very carefully because the Bible gives us a picture. It doesn't necessarily give us step by step by step by step by step of how they got to where they were. I'm telling you, I had a chance from 1999 to today to explain to you what has happened because I was there. So they went from that and then civil union passed. Matter of fact, Vermont boasted of its sin that it was the first legislative act they did that all over the country for civil unions. I think that's what they said. But the point being is they were boasting, calling it humanitarian. Little time passed. All of a sudden, guess what? The homosexuals and lesbian committee group, whatever, met again with our state reps across the nation. No, no, no. No, we're still not being recognized by everybody that we're an okay couple. So we now want marriage. Do you remember the town hall, the people in the town hall that got fired because they wouldn't give them a license or an application for a license to get married? I do. And so what happened is, is they sued the towns. And the people that were the town clerks got fired. I know. I read it. I saw it. And then now, it has exploded to what it is now. And listen, if you think that they are okay, buddy-buddy, with the church, they're not. And those churches that have ignorantly bought into that lie and won't stand up and say, that's not what the Word of God teaches, they think they're okay. But not with God. And so here's the deal. They are now at the place where Christians are afraid to speak truth publicly because they're aggressive and you go to jail because you cause trouble and they don't even if they hit you in the United States right now. 
Why? They want recognition. And you know what else they do? Listen to very carefully. I'm, I'm trying to lead you up to understand in the, the, the day in which we're living in. Do you know what else they do? They go and they seek legislation federally and statewide for protection against harassment from Christians. We're the ones getting punched and beat up and everything else, and they're seeking new laws to protect them in their lifestyle. So in other words, what they're looking for is, Christian, shut your mouth. As a matter of fact, Christian, I don't even want you to shut your mouth. I am so aggressive and so much fire is in my bones. Here's what I want. I want to be next to you. I want you to hear, I want to hear you say that my lifestyle is absolutely acceptable. Sorry, I'm going to go home and meet Jesus before I ever say that. Because it's not true. Now, am I going to be a jerk to them? No, I haven't been and I won't be. But I'm going to speak truth. I can't help it. I'm a pastor. I'm a God, godly man, right? So listen, so listen. They were exceedingly wicked, it says, against the Lord. See, because here's what Jesus said. If you abuse any of the little ones, basically he's saying, better for you to have never been born. See, what they don't know, because they've got this spiritual cloak over their eyes, what they don't know is you don't mess with Jesus' people. See, we may not see anything on this side of eternity, but I'm horrified to think of those that are abusive toward Christians, what they're going to stand before when they stand before the Almighty God. It's almost like you dads. You ought to at least have a little picture of this. Don't mess with the kids because dad will become very ugly, (laughs) right? And that's nothing, nothing when you compare it to God. And what am I saying? Am I saying that, you know, (laughs) hurt me and you'll get it from God? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is can we love them and hopefully God will remove the veil from their eyes so they get saved? That's my hope. Back to Matthew. Whoops. Wow, that was kind of loud. Hang on. Am I going the right way? Boy, that just, wow, could have ended the service. Pick it up at verse 40. At that time, there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Why do you suppose when the angels gather up the people of God, when that shout from heaven, that that trumpet blast, that shout from heaven, Paul says those of us who are alive remain will be caught up together in the air to meet the Lord in the air. Why aren't they both going? Why? Because there's probably a delusion on one and truth reigns in the other. One is a born-again believer and one isn't. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. See, how many of us have that calendar, right? Today's, today's to-do list, uh, meet with the board at 6, have ice cream with the kids. I just threw that in there. I didn't really have ice cream with any kids, but I did meet with the board at 6. <laughs> Maybe it's a want. I kind of wanted ice cream at 1230, but, you know, whatever. Anyway, but the, don't we do that? We fill our calendars up, and, and we don't do like James says when he says, Always tack on. I believe the the idea is always tack on if the Lord wills. Because we don't know what tomorrow holds. It's kind of like making that promise, right? Remember what I shared? I never promised anything to my children, ever. I never said, I promise. Dad promises, never once. I said, you know what? Let's think about going fishing next Saturday. Okay, I'll make every effort to get there, but I'm not promising. I told them that all their lives. I never promised anything to my kids. And it wasn't so it would give me an out. It was so that they recognized that there was something greater than me that was in charge of life in activities. And so most of the time we would go fishing. So I don't want you to think that, oh, I wonder how many times we went fishing. Most of the time. We really did. I took them hunting. I took them fishing. We went for ice cream. We did well, all over the place. We did all kinds of things, but I never promised them anything. And parents, if you have, I would encourage you today, stop. Matter of fact, Jesus says this. 
Let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Anything else is evil. I'm not that smart. I didn't come up with it. To be on the alert in the Greek also means to watch. Now, I want you to listen to this. For example, watching a baby. Isn't that a cutie pie? I just love that little baby expression. That's the cutest little baby right there. What could happen if you stop watching a child while it's in your care? Well, time for lunch. Look what they're going to grab. That's not healthy. They're going to eat a donut. It's on a fork. They're happy. What about if you stop watching your kid? They can get hurt. They can grab a knife out of the kitchen. They can grab matches. I'll tell you one time, I may have said this story, and if I did, I apologize, but it fits. When my son was, my oldest boy, who's now in South Korea, when he was a little boy, he got maybe three, maybe four. I don't even think he was that old. He wasn't feeling good. And so, you know those child-proof locking medicine container, you know, things there, syrup containers? Well, we had one of those. And so I was on the phone with my mom. Now, we didn't have cell phones back then. We had a phone that was attached to the, you know, if you move too fast, you're taking it off the table. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's the kind of phone we had. So my wife was in the bedroom so she could talk to my mom, too. So we were, you know, both on phones. And so, you know, my kid just minding his own business, and I'm minding my own business talking to my mom. And next thing I know, I see him doing something in the kitchen. I didn't think anything of it. All of a sudden, he comes down out of the kitchen, and he's got red all over his face. And here's what he said, medicine for medicine. I said, Mom, got to go. Poof. I grabbed the kid, and I brought him to the toilet, and I made him throw up. Like really bad. I mean, the kid was bawling his eyes out, and he was just throwing. I figured I'd rather have him cry than, 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 than lose the kid. I don't know how much he drank. I just, I'm thinking he just chugged it right along. It had a cherry flavor. I don't know. But, man, I'll tell you, in seconds, I had him in that bathroom, I mean, I don't think I ever moved so fast in my life. I had him in that bathroom, and I had my finger down his throat because I didn't know what Epicac was. I took my finger down his throat. I'm making him throw up, and he's crying. He doesn't understand what's happening. He's just all over the place. I didn't care. Then I called the doctor, and the doctor said, what'd you do? So I made him puke. How? My finger. <laughs> you ever hear of Epicac? What? <laughs> anyway. What could happen if you stop watching a child when it's in your care? The child was in my care. I was on the phone with my mother. He was in the same room as me. There's another story I could tell you that I won't. When my kids were in my care. Not going there. We'll talk privately. Sorry, Facebook. <laughs> what about abduction? Any of you ever been to Hampton Beach? Yeah. Yeah. You ever been to Hampton Beach when there's eight gazillion people there? Well, we were there one summer, and my second born was just this high. A little kid, no higher than my kneecap. And my mom decided she wanted to take him to go get a little treat. Only one problem. She never told anybody. All of a sudden, I'm looking for this child. She didn't even tell my dad. She just felt, you know, hey, honey, let's go for a treat. And... We were doing something. I don't even remember what it was, but our attention was gone. Next thing we know, there's no Nick. Mil hundreds of thousands of people there, realistically. What do you do? I mean, I must have turned all kinds of zillions of colors. I panicked. And so I told my dad to stay with my other kids in one spot. My wife took off one way. I took off another way. I didn't know if I could ever see this child again. There were so many people. And literally, I'm pushing people away to get by them, looking all over the place for my kid. I couldn't, I, you know, it's just going crazy. Next thing I know, <laughs> I see him and my mom at this little place. Can I tell you that my mom and I had a serious time of fellowship? <laughs> That's what I call it. What would happen if you stop watching the child while it's in your care? It could be an, abdu an abduction. If my mom didn't have my child, somebody else could have. Therefore, I'm repeating it, be on the alert for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Now, what follows is what he says regarding 
the attitude, where we should be at in our head, in our heart, and in our spirit. Because it's so important. Because i got to tell you, I'm going to be honest with you, I need to brush up on this. Being on the alert. Because I have lived 57, almost 58 years. And you know what happens in all that time? I've been saved over 35, 6 years. You know what happens in that time? Got a little lackadaisical with being alert, watching. I need the refresher. Look what he says. Be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you must be ready as well. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think he will. So you know what that means? We need to be on the alert 24-7 for the rest of our lives kind of a thing. We need to watch. We need to be careful. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household slaves to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time, and he begins to beat his fellow slaves, and he eats and drinks with those habitually drunk, then the master of that slave will come on a day that he does not expect, and in an hour that he does not know. And he will cut him in two and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's talking about hell. Now, now think about this for just a minute. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not, or that he does not expect. And in an hour, he does not know. What that basically means is, for each one of us as a Christian, wouldn't it be interesting if God came for you when you're involved in your sin? You think he's going to take you, or you think he's going to leave you behind? See, Christian, we forgot to keep short accounts. We forgot to recognize that Jesus is Lord, he's God, he's Savior. We forgot, I think, sometimes in the way that we carry ourselves, that we can just live our lives any old place, that, almost undisciplined. If there's ever a time where Christians need to be more disciplined and ready for Jesus, it's now. Self-discipline. Because he said, nobody knows. I don't know. I can't encourage you and say, hey, listen, Jesus is coming in a week. Make sure you button up and clean up your house. Make sure that whatever is in your house that's sinful, that Jesus might not want to look at. Whatever you're doing for activities, if it's sinful, you might want to stop. He's coming in a week. I can't do that. I have no idea. He could come before I finish this service. Those of us that were alive back in the 70s, I think regardless of where you lived, you'll probably remember the charismatic renewal. There was an explosion in the Catholic faith. There was an explosion everywhere. Hippies were getting saved. I mean, it was explosive. Those of you that watched that show, that movie, I can't remember the name of the movie, but Je Jesus Revolution kind of talks a little bit about that. But one of the things that was dynamic, if you were a Catholic as I was, I was raised in a Catholic home, if you were a Catholic, all of a sudden you started seeing things you'd never seen in a Catholic church before. Your Sunday school teacher was talking about salvation through Christ. Repent. You had the long-haired hippies that couldn't wait to get the guitar in a Catholic church, and all the blue-haired ladies that sat up front were offended. Number one, they had long hair. Number two, they brought a guitar in church. And they weren't singing what they were used to hearing. But here's the thing that I remember the most. You couldn't go to the mall. See, I grew up just outside of Manchester, New Hampshire. You couldn't go to the mall. You couldn't go anywhere without somebody talking to you about Jesus and concerned about your soul. You could not go anywhere. You had tracts given. Sometimes you could have three, four, five, six people at the Mall of New Hampshire, big mall in Manchester. I'll never forget it. Man, I was coming in, minding my own business. I was only th maybe this high, walking across, and all of a sudden somebody comes up and says, Hi, how are you? And I say, Good, you? And I'm thinking, Mom, don't want me to talk to strangers, but you're talking, so we'll talk. 
And all of a sudden, you know, she's sharing about Jesus, gives me a track. Didn't even know what it was. How many people do that now? Have we become, you know, they were motivated back in the 70s because a theme that was preached, and Miss Marcy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a theme that was preached in most churches was Jesus is coming soon. There were books being written about Jesus coming soon. There were movies made about Jesus coming soon, the rapture of the church, what it was going to look like during the seven-year tribulation, and all these kinds of things. Those were happening left and right. Don't you see that there's something that's happening in the world right now and in our circle? I mean, these movies are coming up, and all of a sudden, God is exposing the sin. God is preparing the church. Get ready, church. Get ready, church. Get ready, church. People are going to start wondering what's happening. People are going to start looking for hope. We need to be ready, church. We need to be ready, church. Not only that, but church, we need to be ready because Jesus could come tomorrow. He could come today. Are you ready? Are you ready for his appearing? Yes? No? Maybe? I remember one of my children, when they were small, was hoping that Jesus wouldn't come before she experienced being married. And I said, honey, there ain't no marriage alive that can compare to standing in front of Jesus. She still wanted to get married anyway, and she is. I won't tell you which one. Because <laughs> I think most of you know both of my children, my daughters. My point is this. Have we stopped being on the alert? I can tell you, there are times in my life I have. Have we stopped being on the watch? I can tell you there were times in my life where we have, I have. Have we lost our passion to prepare folks for his second coming? Because it is going to happen. I just don't know when. He hasn't told me. He hasn't told any of us. Have we lost that passion to share Jesus is coming? Some of you are saying, I'm not built like that. Well, okay. Let me ask you a question before we conclude our service. What's the favorite thing that you like to talk about? You don't even need to be provoked to talk about it. If it's anything other than Jesus, then you need this message today. There's nothing more that I desire to talk about Jesus. I'll talk about other things, but I would rather talk about Jesus than anything else. That's my favorite subject. He is my favorite subject to talk about. If that's not your favorite subject, then you might need Jesus today. You need to fall back in love with Jesus. The Bible tells us in Revelation when he deals with one of the churches, he says, I have this against you. You have lost your first love. Go back. Go back to that place where Jesus, Jesus is your first love. Because here's the cool thing about Jesus being your first love. You don't need a preacher to tell you, careful, don't sin. Jesus is your first love. You don't want to sin. Now, if you do, you repent. Just like my wife and I. I love her with everything. And if I sin, I repent. Honey, I'm sorry, whatever. Same thing from her. But Jesus should be absolutely number one. The number one thing that you do not need to be provoked to talk about because you are just so full of Jesus. I'm going to close with this. I watched this pastor, I can't remember his name, but I have, I have a couple of his books. And he was praying one time, and he's like, Lord, you know, I, I, give me souls, give me souls. Help me to talk to this person. Help me to talk to that person. And he's going on and on and on, and, and he felt like the Lord direct, redirected him and said this. He said, stop asking me for souls. He said, start asking me for my presence and my closeness and your love for me to grow, because if you have that, 
you won't be stopping. You, you won't need to pray that you will automatically be sharing Jesus. Yeah, think about it. Those of you that are married, those of you that are in love, think about it. Does anybody have to provoke you? Did anybody have to provoke you to talk about the love you have for your spouse? Nah. Matter of fact, they probably want to shut you up because you talk too much about the love for your wife or your husband. Right? Look, I'm sick of hearing. I know all about him because you've just not shut your mouth about him. I, I know all about her. I just, you just don't stop talking about her. And matter of fact, I could probably pick her out of a lineup. You know, you just keep talking about her and talking about her and talking about her and talking about her. Oh, wouldn't that be great if they could save the Christian? Oh, would you just shut up? I can see Jesus a mile away because you keep talking about him, talking about him, talking about him, talking about him. I'll pick him out of a lineup. You keep talking about him, talking about him, talking about him. Oh, my goodness, I'm learning more about him from your mouth than I do anywhere I go. Unprovoked. Be a loving. And I got to tell you, Facebook's not a bad place to share your stuff. Don't lose sight of the face to face. Don't lose sight of the face to face. Because honestly, I don't know about you folks, but Facebook is one of those things where vroom, 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 vroom. Oh, that's nice. Chris put something on it. Vroom, vroom. Vroom. Oh, that's nice. Uh, the, the kings put something on there. Vroom, vroom, vroom. You know what I mean? Do we not do that? Some of you are like, I don't want to lose my love. It's okay. <laughs> but when we're face to face, it's that song. I love that song. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about what he said to me today about there's something I learn new from him. Let me tell you about his characteristics. Let me tell you about his personality. Let me tell you about what he did in my life. Unprovoked. Because we're living in the last days. Are you ready? Those in the church, those online, you by YouTube, even though you're not seeing it yet, you'll see it later. I'm going to ask you this morning, are you ready? Are you hopelessly and helplessly in love with Jesus? Do you love him first and foremost above anybody else, anything else? If not, if not. And that's an answer, that's, that's a question you can ask yourself. That's an answer that the Holy Spirit can resonate in your heart. Some of us instantly might say, absolutely, I just love Jesus with all my heart. Well, let me ask you this. Are you sure? Are you justifying sin? Because if you are, then you're not just loving Jesus with all your heart. Are you reading his word? Well, if you're not, then you're not loving Jesus with all your heart because you want to know about him. You want to know about his word. Are you praying? Well, maybe not. Well, then you don't love Jesus with all your heart. I'm giving you some, some, some recipe. It's like if my wife would know if I didn't love her, if I didn't want to spend time with her, if I didn't want to talk to her, if I didn't want to hang out with her, she'd get suspicious. She'd be like, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I'm not feeling the love. Can I ask you a question? Is Jesus feeling your love? If that's you and you're on Facebook, you can make a place right at your sofa or wherever you are. You can make a place right there. And you can say, Jesus, I'm going to be absolutely drop dead honest with you because you already know. I'm not there. I kind of feel like you're speaking to me like you spoke to that church. Go back to your first love. Some of you may never have had a first love with Jesus. Some of you may have prayed a prayer but your life didn't change. Jesus didn't, didn't begin. It's just like when you're single, you live a certain way, and when you hook up with somebody, you live completely different the day that you start going out. You stop looking. Something changes. When we become born again, something needs to change. That's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 16, my spirit bears witness with his spirit that I'm a child of the living God. Nobody can do that but God. Are you there? Is that you? If it's not you, it can be today. You can invite Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Let him have control of your life. How do you do that? Read his, 
read his word. You can ask him to forgive you of your sin. You may not even know some of the sins that you're committing. You may not even know any of the sins you're committing, especially if you don't know his Bible. Read his Bible. And every time you come up to something where the Lord convicts you of your sin, and you say, okay, God, your word says that what I'm doing here is wrong, and I'm agreeing with you, because that's basically what it is. I'm agreeing with you that what I'm doing is wrong, the way that I think is wrong, the way that I act is wrong. I want your help. I want to change the way that I think and adopt your way of thinking. I want to change the way that I live so that I can adopt your way of living, because... You love me, and it's better for my life. And then, Lord, I don't know about you folks, but this is a prayer that I pray, and I have, because I know what it feels like. Lord, I got sin, and it's weighing me down. As a matter of fact, it's keeping me away from you. And so, Lord, right where I'm at right now, I'm asking you, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of my sin. And you know what's real funny about that? He will. If you're sincere, he will. However, don't go back. Cleanse me of my sin, Lord. Keep short accounts with him. Every time you see in the scripture, ah, you know what, I just, Lord, I'm sorry. Help change the way that I think about this. Because I feel I need to say this, and then I am closing. Pastor Dan the other day had a Bible study out of Psalm 106. It was powerful. God spoke to me. Did you ever have in your life a sin that you just can't get rid of? It's like, man, it just doesn't want to leave you. Can I tell you why? You remember way back when God was telling the people of Israel, when you go into your land, make sure you destroy everything there so that you do not adopt their sinful behaviors. Otherwise, if you don't, that will be a snare for you. Can I tell you why you struggle with the same sin over and over and over again? is because you didn't kill it when you came to Jesus. It has become a snare to you. Can I tell you the best way to get rid of your sin? I don't care what your sin is. Cut it off. Jesus said it best. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He's not talking about literally. Otherwise, we'd have no hand. What he's talking about is, if there is something someone that is causing you to sin that you're losing your testimony over, cut it off. Better, he said, that you enter life maimed than have your whole body and it take you to hell. See, when the children of Israel were heading into the promised land, the reason that God wanted them to kill everybody and wipe out every idol and all that stuff is he knew that it would be a snare to them. Let me give you a couple of pieces of advice. You got a problem with your language? Here's what I'd encourage you to do. Anything and everything that you have in your house, in your possession, whatever, apart from if you're going to work at a secular job, cut it off and start filling your head with the Word of God. You know, they have these things called cell phones now. They can read it for you. You don't even have to read. Just play it over and over and over and over and over in your head. Over and over. Get the Word of God in your head. Because remember, Deuteronomy chapter 6 said, listen, with the Word of God, put it on your mantle. Put it on your door. Put it all over your walls. When you get up in the morning, tell your kids. In the afternoon, tell your kids. In the evening, tell your kids. What's he saying? Get my Word in you. It'll get the junk out of you. It'll take the snares that want to drag you down and it will throw those things out you will be free sexual sin break it off cut it off hallelujah get that little cell phone and instead of looking up bad sites and the Lord said unto you Get that word of God just ringing in your ear. 
trouble with this, trouble with that, click, get that word of God in your ear. Get that word of God in your ear. Get that word of God in your ear. Let the word of God richly dwell in you, Paul says. Let the word of God richly dwell in you. That's one great way to repent. Let the word of God just richly dwell in you. Get the word of God in. Get the word of God in so all the junk can come out. All the junk that's binding you. All the junk that wants to strap you down. Get it out. Even if you fall asleep while you're listening to it, so what? In your subconscious, maybe you'll have a better dream. Amen? You got trouble with love? Get the word of God in you. Memorize the first John. Not John the gospel, but first John. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that does not love does not know God. First John 4, 7 and 8. Get the word of God richly dwelling in you. Get the word of God richly dwelling in you. Get the word of God richly dwelling in you. Put it in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're on this thing and you've been listening. Do it. Stop arguing. Stop blaming the devil. God's given you a powerful spirit that if you allow him to lead you, the devil's going to leave you. And you're going to get God in you. Start by repenting right now. Those of us that are here, and you can stand to your feet if you want to make that bold declaration. You at home, same thing. And say, I just, I want this gone. I want, I, want to, I want to come back to my first love. I want to be ready. I don't want to be tied down with anything. I don't want sin to tie me down. I don't want anything to mess me up. I want God to have all of me. And he doesn't right now, but I'm going to do the best I can every single day and have God more in my life, more involved in my life. I want freedom. I want the joy of freedom. I want clarity of conscience. I want clarity of soul. If that's you and you want to stand up, let's do this. Because I'm standing. I'm right here. I'm human just as much as you are. You're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Come on. Hallelujah. You want God to just set you free this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can be set free. You've got to want to. You've got to want to. Let him set you free this morning. Let him set you free. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just ask him this morning. Lord, hear the sincerity of my heart. Hear the sincerity of my heart. Be like that thief on the cross where he says, Lord, I'm guilty. You're not. I am. Please remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Just in the sincerity of your heart. Just begin to cry out to him. Lord Jesus, I need you. I need you. I'm sick and tired of not being ready. I'm sick and tired of having a lack of discipline in my life in the area of spiritual things. Lord Jesus, regardless of how long I've been serving you, Lord Jesus, I want to have that freshness all over again. Hallelujah. I don't want to be bogged down with sin. I don't want to be bogged down with anything. Lord, it, some of us may feel trapped in this or trapped in that. It doesn't matter, Lord God. We can be released from the trap. You have the key. Hallelujah. And I believe the key is the Word of God, is the Spirit of God, hallelujah, our submission to your Word, our submission to your Spirit. And so, God, I ask you right now, all across this room, including myself, Lord God, if there's anything that wants to bind us, that wants to be a snare in our life, whatever sin that might be, whatever it is, Lord God, we want it cut off, hallelujah. We want it cut off today. And Lord God, if it wants to raise its ugly head, we're going to do what we need to do. We're going to get into your word. We're going to get into prayer. We're going to call a friend if we need to in the, in the body of Christ and say, I need you to pray. I need your help. I need Jesus. Pray with me. Pray with me until I get strong enough on my own. Pray with me. Help me today. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, this is a spiritual battle that we're fighting, and I believe right now, all over this place, Lord, there are spiritual things that are happening in every life that's here. And I ask you, in Jesus' name, out in the uh, Facebook land, out in YouTube land, I pray, God, whoever has stayed with us, whoever is at this point with us, that they would cut it off. That they would cut it off. Cut it off. Cut it off. Lord, we want to grow in you. We want to be free. We want to look forward to your coming. We want to look forward to seeing you face to face. We want to have no stop hanging on to us down here, Lord God, that would keep us from a desire to being intimately close with you. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Have your way in our lives. And Lord, I pray, God, I, I, it won't be something we have, to, we have to think about too much, Lord God, but as we begin to put more of you in us, just like if we're dating fresh and new or brand new married, we're going to start talking about Jesus. Why? Because you're going to become the love of our lives like never before. Hallelujah. Help us to come back to our first love, those of us that have left it. For those of us that have never had it, Lord, we welcome your love into our lives so we can express your love to others. Jesus, we need you, Lord. We need you. Forgive us of our sins, O oh God. Hallelujah. If that's you, just like everybody else, Lord, just raise your hands and just cry out sincerely, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Oh, Lord, I want it gone. I want it gone. I don't want the snare. I don't want any snare. Lord, I just give it to you right now. You paid the debt. You paid the price. I can't pay. I can't cleanse myself. Oh, Jesus, I cry out, and I trust in your word where it says your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. This morning when we got up, your mercies were new. Before we came to church, your mercies are new. After we heard this message, your mercies are new. Lord Jesus, you want to cleanse us right now. Hallelujah. From the depths of the sincerity of our hearts, Lord God, we're crying out to you right now. We're going to tell you what our sin is, and we're going to ask you, Lord God, come and cleanse us. Come and cleanse us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You don't have to confess it out loud because there's a number of us here, but just begin to confess your sin before Jesus. Stuff that comes to your heart, confess it before Jesus. Pride, confess it before Jesus. Uh, James gives the three biggies. It's the, the root cause of sin. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. Lord, we confess those things to you right now. Lord, cleanse us. And not just today, Lord, I'm sure we'll have to come back to the cross tomorrow. We'll have to come back to Jesus tomorrow and ask you to touch us again. And Lord, till we become disciplined, till we develop a beautiful relationship with you, Lord God, where we can't wait to be in your presence, we can't wait to be in your word, we can't wait to talk to you, because we love you so much. Lord, that's going to permeate from us. Hallelujah. Have your way this morning. Have your way, Lord, this morning. Saturate us in Jesus' name. Saturate us in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to give you instruction here, folks. I'm going to give you instruction. And then we're going to shut the, the Facebook off. Listen very carefully. Some of you are probably thinking, how am I going to know that I've been forgiven? Some of us might be asking that question. That's a great question. One of the ways you can know that you have been forgiven is you can feel his forgiveness. I know this. I've been burdened with, with sin before in my life, and when God cleansed me, oh my goodness, I could see I could look at people in the eye. I got clarity of conscience, not because of my goodness, but because of his forgiveness. You feel like it. As a matter of fact, here's what God's going to do in your life too. Are you ready for this? He's going to resubmit in your spirit a heavy conviction not to go there again. If it's easy to you, for you to go back into your sin, then keep crying out until you feel his forgiveness. Until you recognize his forgiveness. Because when his spirit comes in, you should be getting alarm bells, the alertness, alarm bells and saying, no, don't go there. Don't go there. Take your phone. Word of God. Put it in your head. Listen to it. Get his word in your head. As it said in Deuteronomy 6, on your doorpost, on your walls, on your ceiling. In the morning, talk about my word. In the afternoon, talk about my word. In the evening, talk about my word. Fill your life with the word of God. Amen? Because when God convicted me of my sin, cleansed me of my sin when I was first saved in particular, let me tell you, the next time that I used foul language, I got convicted so bad, I never did it again. Actually, that was a lie. Sorry, Lord. I didn't do it as frequently, and it became gone. So you know it's been like decades. <laughs> God takes it away. God takes it away. Amen? Amen? So from here, walk in his forgiveness. Walk in his cleansing. Walk in his joy. 
If something happens, guess what? Ask his forgiveness right away. Keep short accounts. And then ask him to help you to be disciplined. Come on now. Ask, ask him, I need, I need your discipline, Lord. Not that he spanks you, but, you know, I need, my, I need discipline, self-discipline. Amen? Amen. Thanks for staying long with us. I know it's been a long service, but I think it was worth it. I believe God was doing some neat things, and I hope he was doing great things in your life because I know he's been doing them here. So God bless you. Until next time, may the Lord be with you in Jesus' name. Amen.